Testing, testing, okay. Good morning, everybody. Can you, those of you with your headphones hear me? Okay. Um, we, uh, here we go. Okay, we're, we have one more panelist who's running late, but we're going to go ahead and get started without him. Um, um, but we just wanted to close one issue <laughs> uh, quickly. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started? So good morning and welcome to day three of the IGF. Uh, my name is Liesl Franz and I'm with the U.S. Department of State and welcome to the workshop on cybersecurity public policy that achieves privacy and civil liberties. Um, I'm sort of delighted by the by the scheduling of this workshop today because I think there's been so much conversation already about the issues that we'll be dealing with today um, and um, so I'm hoping that uh, when we, w once we hear some opening remarks from our panelists, then I'm hoping we can engage in a, 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 a robust discussion that picks up on some of those earlier comments. The idea for this workshop was to look at cybersecurity from a public policy perspective that includes the synergistic relationship between cybersecurity, privacy, and civil liberties, and trying to look at it through the lens that those three issues are not mutually exclusive or always in conflict. That there is a way to deal with them that are mutually reinforcing, that are um, that are um, multi-stakeholder uh, in nature and um, can um, ensure the necessary environment to protect individuals as they utilize um, the dynamic and empowering medium that is the internet. So without further ado, I'm going to give a brief introduction of our expert panelists, and um, I commend you to their full biographies on the IGF website, um, because they are truly all um, experts in their field. Um, our first panelist today, we are sort of a little out of order now, so um, we'll try not to confuse you, but our first first. Um, Remarks will come from Michael Niebel, who is the head of the Task Force on Internet Policy Development at the European Commission. 
he worked on the commission's data privacy data protection directive and also, also was working on cybersecurity is, issues so um, he has a nice nexus for today's conversation um, then I'll turn um, to Ms. Yara Salam who is currently the program manager of the Women Human Rights Defenders Program at NASRA for the Feminist Studies in Europe. Her current work involves managing the first program in Europe that focuses on women human rights defenders, how to be able to support them, and document the violations that they face from state and non-state non -state actors. So she'll provide a very specific example of um, a country dealing specifically with these issues. Um, then I'll uh, turn to Kevin Bankston, who is Senior Counsel and Director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Te Democracy and Technology. It's a Washington-based nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting democratic values and constitutional liberties in the digital age. And then we'll turn to Nizar Zaka. He is the founder and Secretary General of the Union of the Arab ICT Associations, or IJMA, um, and that now counts for 16 regional members, which makes it the largest ICT network in the Middle East and North Africa. In addition, Mr. Zak was recently appointed as Vice Chairman of the World IT Services Alliance, I believe in their last meeting in Toronto, correct? Great. And then last but certainly not least, um, um, we'll hear from Robert Guerra, who is a civil society expert specializing in issues of internet governance, cybersecurity, social networking, multi-stakeholder participation, internet freedom, and human rights. He's the founder of Privatera, a Canadian-based company that works with private industry and intergovernmental inter organizations. And he works as a special advisor to the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. So pretty much my job is to moderate and get out of the way. Um, what I'd like to do after we hear from each of them, oh, and then when our six panelists joins us, I will introduce him as well. Um, but our, once we hear brief remarks of opening nature from each of the panelists, we want to make this as interactive as possible. And what I'd really like to do, because I think it seems to be working here at the IGF, is to get a few questions or comments from at once. So maybe we'll bundle three at a time and then allow our panelists to address them in, um, all together. So be thinking about that as we move along. So with that, if I may turn to you, Michael. Thank you. As Liesl mentioned, I've been uh, working on the privacy and starting the privacy directive in the Union, and that was at the beginning of the 90s, uh, when in the Union we, we, we didn't talk at that level about security, and security is coming now much more into the focus, and in the coming months we will uh, present a new strategy um, uh, regarding the security. But we will also uh, stress in this strategy uh, that we will strive to keep the core values that we have in Europe uh, also in the security and uh, resilience area. Uh, the fight against crime and the fight uh, and the protection of, of critical infrastructures often entails the processing of vast amounts of data and the intrusion into citizens' privacy. And we always have to balance these. And we also have to safeguard freedom of expression. And there can be no division or double standards regarding human rights online. The strategic framework for human rights in the action plan of the EU foresees that we have to ensure that a clear human rights perspective and impact assessment is present in the development of policies and programs relating to cyber security, the fight against cyber crime, internet governance, and other EU policies in this regard. What does this require in practice? Each particular policy measure generates specific issues. It is therefore difficult to comment on policies that are in nature quite different. There are important differences between policy measures to combat sexual exploitation of children online and measures to combat violation of intellectual property. Any policy measure restricting a fundamental right to privacy must take into account the principle of proportionality. This is required under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Charter. Any measure 
taken must respond to an imperative social need. It is not enough to be useful. Legislative measures limiting the right to privacy of individuals have to be accessible and foreseeable as regards their implications for the persons concerned. For example, in defining the EU cybersecurity strategy, the Commission will strive to define clearly what cybersecurity threats incidents are covered, which organizations are bound by the laws. And I would like to give an example where we have already implemented something which is combining security and privacy aspects. In the e-privacy directive, security breaches have to be notified. And if this security breach implies the privacy violations, they also have to be notified to the person concerned. So there we have the two aspects in one legal instrument. To, to preserve the benefits of cyberspace and a shared responsibility for all of us is a key aspect of our policy regarding security. And of course, the multi-stakeholder model is something that we cherish and we support. So we don't see necessarily a difference between the two, safeguarding human rights, safeguarding privacy or data protection and protecting the security and the resilience of our networks. And I am looking forward to exchanging with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That provides a nice uh, overview for us to uh, start with for the day. Yara, please. Um, so I work for an Egyptian feminist organization, and so my focus would be uh, on Egypt. Um, I would give this, the aspect of the human rights concerning cybersecurity. So um, our main concern uh, is that always, w when it comes to cybersecurity, it's always connected to the state security. It's never connected to the user's privacy. Um, and in this regards, there is a huge uh, lack of information and regulation on the way that private companies are providing surveillance um, uh, softwares to repressive regimes or maybe all governments, uh, if I may say. And I'm giving the example of uh, a specific uh, incident in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, activists were able to break into uh, the premises of the state security uh, during... Um, yeah, during the revolution time. Uh, and they found uh, papers that dates back to 2009, uh, w in which uh, a software company called Gamma Group International, which is uh, a European-based uh, company uh, that has the headquarters in the UK. And it had an offer uh, for selling a software called Finn Fisher uh, with 388,000 uh, euros which equalized to 2 million Egyptian pounds. Uh, and all the papers and are scanned online, so they are available to anyone to see. And it mainly said that it can actually access and hack all Gmail, Yahoo, uh, Hotmails, and Skype accounts for activists for any kind of reason. And they gave a free trial to the Egyptian government. Um, and there was a, um, a report by the IT department in the service security uh, uh, department and the Ministry of Interior saying on the 1st of January 2011, so it's like 24 days before the, the revolution started, uh, saying that they did the free trial uh, of the software and it's an excellent uh, uh, tool to hack into people's accounts and emails and so on. Uh, if activists weren't or if Egyptians were not able to enter the premises uh, of uh, state security, they would have never knew about the software. And uh, we don't have any access to public information about anything related to our security. We don't know what happened to the dat data that were collected by the government uh, during the trial period. Um, and up till now, uh, I cannot really say that we uh, succeeded in removing the regime. Uh, so we still have state security, but with a different name. Uh, it's called national security now. Uh, but the, the thing that we're missing at the moment, I believe that we need uh, transparency and regulation 
concerning exchange of spyware uh, between whether between companies and regimes or whether between governments and each other. Uh, and I'll leave it to here and I'll wait for your comments or questions if needed. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sarah, for the very specific um, and uh, provocative example. Thank you. Kevin. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. My comments are going to focus on protecting fundamental rights when formulating national and international cybersecurity policy and the important role of civil society in doing that. Um, there are admittedly serious threats to cybersecurity that require serious responses, but when considering avenues for international cooperation in maintaining cybersecurity, CDT, my organization, proceeds from the fundamental premise that in our pursuit of a more secure network, we must work equally hard to preserve fundamental rights, including and especially the rights to privacy and free expression. Ensuring cybersecurity efforts are both effective and rights respecting uh, requires collaboration from a wide uh, range of stakeholders. Um, let's say cybersecurity policy formulation is like a chair with four legs. Uh, governments, companies, uh, technical experts, and civil society and human rights advocates, uh, like uh, several of the folks on this panel. Uh, if one of the legs of the chair is weak, the, the chair and uh, the policy is, is likely to fail. Um, as a representative of civil society, I naturally believe that participation of civil society is a key ingredient. Civil society can contribute insights that may not be apparent to industry and government, can ensure a proper accounting of human rights. Um, civil society already makes important contributions to existing multi-stakeholder processes, and that should be equally true in the cybersecurity arena. Uh, my organization's experience dealing with cybersecurity in the United States, I think, illustrates this. Um, in the United States, we've been looking at legislation to deal with information sharing to deal with cybersecurity. The conundrum, the difficult problem of, of cybersecurity-based information sharing is that network providers and other uh, online services want to be able to share information indicative of an attack or a likely attack. However, that information can also uh, include or often will include personally identifiable information or the contents of, of private communications. Um, so there is a need for some level of information sharing more than our law currently allows for, but at the same time it carries a huge privacy risk, in particular because a broadly worded allowance for sharing of information potentially related to a cybersecurity attack could essentially amount to a backdoor wiretapping program and enable a great deal of information sharing with the government without adequate uh, safeguards and due process. So earlier this year, civil society and including my organization backed by an activist community in the US that was energized by its victory in defeating SOPA and PIPA, the copyright enforcement bills last year, uh, worked very hard to uh, get amendments to a cybersecurity proposal in our uh, Congress's uh, Senate, uh, a bill called the Cybersecurity Act. And working with policymakers and technologists and companies uh, civil society was able to get a number of important improvements uh, to this bill. We were able to get uh, restriction of sharing between government agencies such that the information shared by companies would only go to civilian agencies rather than the military. Uh, civilian agencies typically being more transparent and more accountable than the military. Uh, we got limits on the t types of data that could be shared, limited to very specific types of threat indicators. Um, specific limits on the use of the data, where before the data could essentially be used for investigation of practically any crime, uh, we narrowed it to primarily cybersecurity crimes. Um, we made, uh, got amendments that uh, free expression, First Amendment protected speech in our country, uh, could not be considered a cyber crime and did not rise to a cybersecurity threat that could warrant information sharing. And we finally got a number of reporting mechanisms that would ensure that everyone had a very good idea of what type of information was being shared by whom, to whom, and for what purpose. Um, so put very simply, we were able to get a number of amendments to this bill, which the Senate will be taking up again uh, now that the election has concluded. Uh, we were able to get changes to this bill that were consistent with fair information practices principles. Um, and uh, I think that was uh, in no small part because this was a fairly transparent process that involved civil society the utmost. 
in contrast, uh, CDT is concerned about the possibility of the International Telecommunication Union attempting to set cybersecurity policy, as some member states have proposed. Um, if you go to our website, uh, we have a number of ITU-related resources, or I have some handouts here if you're curious about our position. I don't want to turn this into an ITU panel, uh, but we are concerned that the process of revision of the ITRs is, is not transparent or inclusive enough to ensure the, the setting of, of good, strong, and just cybersecurity policy that fully accommodates uh, human rights concerns. Um, rather than amending the ITRs to include references to cybersecurity, we think all stakeholders, including the ITU, should be focused on strengthening the consensus-driven multi-stakeholder models under which the Internet is developed uh, and, and continues to flourish, including, including the forum we're attending today. So, uh, thank you. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Nizar, if I could turn to you. Thank you. Our organization, I am Secretary General of an organization that deals with uh, ICT, uh, uh, private sector, I represent the ICT private sector in the Middle East and North Africa. And we feel that, I, I agree with, with Yara, that most of when we discuss cybersecurity in this part of the world today, we, we are discussing what Secret Service wants to do in order to monitor and to control the Internet in our part of the world. Uh, today, today we feel we feel uh, uh, we feel that a new components are being introduced to the equation, with, which is religion, and a lot of a lot of the laws, a, a very a series of laws are being tried to be passed at this time, in order to in, to uh, to invade the privacy under the name of security, uh, and uh, and protecting religion and safety online. And we want to make sure that the multi-stakeholder approach is available in this part of the world, and, uh, and especially to, to have everything starting from freedom online and the freedom of expression to be the base for anything we want to start. And this is only can be protected through, our, through the civil society to be a major stakeholder. Once we provide the, the civil society, the local, the national and regional civil society with enough awareness and information in order to have a, a very solid position on the issues. So, so far, there is not enough awareness on, on all these issues in, in, the, in this part uh, of the world by the civil society. So this is what I think needs to be done. Okay. Thank you, Nizar. Robert. Sure. Excuse me for my voice. I'll try to speak as uh, loud as I can. First of all, thank you all of you, and thank you, Liesl, for inviting me on this panel. Um, what I'm going to try to do is just uh, share some of the perspectives related to, to the work that we've done at the uh, Citizen Lab, uh, both related to research and, and some of the policy recommendations. Um, I've just uh, tweeted a comprehensive paper, actually, related to this, um, which I'm happy to um, to share with Liesl um, later. I think um, if we're talking about civil society and, and different stakeholders um, and the importance of, of, of civil liberties, I think, uh, you know, what we first have to realize is, um, you know, who are the actors in cyberspace and how has the space evolved over the last many years? Um, if we want to try to define cyberspace as the connected networks and all the policies around it, what we've seen over the last five, what I would say probably ten years, is an increasing role of, of governments and particularly in kind of intelligence and the military complex in the, the, um, in the issues related to cybersecurity. In a sense, we've gone from an open network to a more securitized network. Uh, where governments are including them in their national defense plans and other issues as well too. And so um, it's, it's key is the space is uh, increasingly where governments are being involved or it's seen as a national security um, issue as well, um, that civil society and other stakeholders uh, be alert to that and be able to speak the language to make sure that they're included in the conversations and that uh, any policy positions that they take forward um, be comprehensive and, and use the language that the others are doing as well, too. Um, I'm going to go through um, uh, six kind of um, issues to think about when developing a, um, uh, a policy related to cybersecurity that uh, Ron Debert at the Citizen Lab has articulated in a uh, quite developed paper that I mentioned I, I just shared now. 
is first of all, uh, we have to start with um, a variety of different things, but one, if, we're, if civil society is trying to recommend things to, to governments or to um, regional institutions, uh, like the case of the EU or, or others, is first of all, some key things to think about is um, if it's a type of policy that's going to affect all, uh, the private sector, um, and again, going on the, the privacy issues that um, was mentioned earlier, is a data breach notification, which we think is, is really key. We've seen a lot of issues, uh, not only in the U.S., but in other countries. Uh, users need to know if their data is being breached, um, and some of the privacy implications and what the companies and the governments are doing when that occurs. I think we need to underscore when... Um, uh, when discussing with the government that privacy and core rights should be seen as security issues and as important as security issues. We cannot just talk about threats and attacks, but equally rights need to be put on the same level. Um, when talking about some of the national security issues and how it might affect a particular uh, country and the infrastructure, um, let's not just say that that's the case and then leave it for the um, um, officials that are involved in national security. Um, what Ron Ebert and others have called upon is we need to open the black box and we need to discuss more what those national security issues are. Um, and as you were saying, Kevin, uh, in the U.S., can some of those roles that are possibly being defined be shifted to more civilian agencies that are under oversight and democratic control? Um, for another thing for cybersecurity is that we need to be aware that a lot of the policy that gets um, developed at a national level will have, uh, or domestic policies, will have international implications. That was the case for SOPA PIPA, for example. Um, though it was defeated, in a sense, and it would have, um, in, it was something related to copyright, it would have affected uh, the DNS possibly around the world. And it creates examples, democratic countries set examples in the policies, not only that they pass, but also on the policies that they introduce. Um, other countries will pick them up, even though they may be failed in one country, and pass them in others. So if we want to practice human rights and internet freedom abroad, we need to practice at home the same thing and not actually create template language that's used by countries like Azerbaijan and others. And we need to start on fundamentals and first principles and defining what are our core values as a preamble as we go forward. You mentioned some of this, Michael, in terms of the importance of privacy in Europe. I think that needs to be adopted by other countries as well. And hear our core values and then frame everything in, in regards to that. Um, in regards to some of the issues that were mentioned earlier, uh, in regards to Egypt, another thing, um, we've done a lot of work at the Citizen Lab together with Privacy International, Google, and many others in documenting the very worrying um, malware industrial complex that's evolved um, where companies are taking advantage of zero-day um, vulnerabilities, creating products that are sold, targeted originally for law enforcement but used for a variety of other purposes including um, uh, spying on its citizens around the world. Um, it is malware that goes into the wild and in a sense is um, what I would say almost like a a virus, a smallpox virus that may be sent to this audience. It may affect and kill some, but then it'll it'll affect the whole population. I think the same case is something like malware. So the case of Egypt, I would say, um, that's something that was discovered, but because of some of those documents that were discovered in the National Security Archives, people started studying that, and the gamma documents were there, and that started a very comprehensive documentation by others like us and, and Privacy International and others. And it was shown that that product um, actually went to other uh, places as well. But one thing is finding the binder. The other thing is actually figuring out if, in fact, it was deployed or not. And some organizations have done that. And the problem is it's not only uh, when malware is deployed into an environment. It may not only affect NGOs. I would say it targets everyone in the Egyptian uh, ecosystem. And so private sector companies, diplomats that are traveling Egypt could have been equally affected. And so tactical, what I would say, malware that is deployed has an effect on all the different stakeholders. And we, as other speakers have mentioned in other panels, need to be very careful when these type of um, um, tools are used and deployed by one type of stakeholder group, be it law enforcement, it will have implications for others and internationally it can be used as well. So I'll finish in wrapping up and saying two things. Um, I think in talking about this issue, core values of human rights um, and privacy need to be core values 
and what we do at home will have international implications and look forward to the discussion we will have on this issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Robert. Um, and we are now then joined by our um, sixth panelist, and I'll just briefly introduce him and then let him make his um, sort of opening remarks. Um, I'd like to introduce Jimmy Schulz. He's a member of the German Parliament for the Liberal Free Democratic Party since 2009. He is a full member of the Interior Committee and substitute member of the Culture and Media Committee. He's an entrepreneur at heart, and he founded Cyber Solutions, which went on the stock market in 2000. And he has been an active member of the FDP since 2000 and fighting for civil liberties and freedom of the Internet. So um, Jim will provide a little bit of perspective from Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about in the German Parliament about the, what we are fighting about is that freedom on the one hand and security on the other hand. And uh, we have to ha look if it's in, in, uh, in a weight position. Um, well, personally, I, I do think in doubt, vote for freedom. But um, in the parliament, we have to uh, accept that every position has to be um, discussed uh, severely. You might, you might wonder, especially why Germany is so um, interested in privacy and, and data protection. I think it's... Um, it's in the history of Germany, maybe this is the answer of the question why privacy and data protection is so important in Germany. We had two states on German soil last century which, isn't, which haven't been uh, treating their um, inhabitants quite well and haven't respected privacy and uh, um, personal data very well. Um, and one of these states uh, just disappeared 20, 23, 22 years ago. So um, there's a great interest that the state doesn't collect data of yours. Uh, your privacy is uh, respected. Um, and, um, as being a liberal, of course, I, um, I doubt the state will handle my data correctly. So um, we're, this is one of the, the key um, issues I'm, I'm dealing with in the parliament. Um, when I was elected 2009, we had a law of uh, data uh, internet blocking uh, to protect us from child pornography on the internet, and it was uh, um, it was made it was made this law was um, well uh, not very well made because it was um, DNS faking. So um, um, I was fighting against that law all the time because it can be it could be misused, and some of the parliamentarians are, are, had already been discussing, but it could also be used to. Um, um, get rid of um, um, copyright violations and things like that. So um, and we've been discussing uh, that law for about two years and when we get rid of it because uh, we started to understand that uh, uh, internet blocking will, is not the solution to get rid of child pornography on the internet and it's, um, well, it's the first step into censorship because it can be misused and normally, um, if um, someone can misuse um, a technology um, and a state might use, misuse a technology, um, it doesn't take much time until it is misused. And uh, we had that discussion very early um, that this law uh, can be misused, for example, for uh, internet blocking of uh, well, unwanted political um, um, <clears throat> unwanted political uh, uh, websites and um, copyright violations. So we got rid of the law and, um, almost uh, one and a half years ago. And when I was elected in 2009, we had a law for data retention. And I was fighting against that since 2005, 2006. And um, the federal law of Germany, um, your constitution uh, 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 just uh, uh, justice uh, said okay this is unlawful um, so we got rid of that too um, it's not that easy right at the moment because uh, European Union wants us to have data retention but we're not doing it right now um, we're not gonna have it uh, and we're gonna fight against it um, in the next couple of uh, years until we may have changed it in the European Union um, and we've done a lot of other things um, uh, concerning cybersecurity and trying to protect on the one side and on the other side 
trying to protect freedom and civil rights. Uh, on the other hand, um, we've been um, uh, establishing a cyber uh, security defen uh, a defense center where all the information is gathered together, but on a um, on a, a basis where uh, everyone can say, okay, I'd like to uh, offer your information, but you don't have to. Uh, I think that's a good way to, to start, um, on the one hand side, security, and on the other hand, um, to respect freedom and uh, civil liberties. That's for the point. Great. Well, thank you very much um, for providing us with very specific um, things to talk about. Um, I'd like to open the floor for um, questions and uh, discussion, because um, I think there are there's much fodder provided this morning, and as well as throughout the, as I mentioned earlier, as well as throughout the IGF to date. Um, so I think there's a microphone. Thank you very much. Um, can we take some questions? And um, just for those that joined late, what I'd like to do is take two or three questions at a time and um, then allow our panelists to address them so that we can have sort of a dynamic uh, discussion. Um, so um, why don't we, we have one question there, we have one question there, we have a third for our first round. Great. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, excuse me. I would like to oh, know. And again, um, if you could, I'm sorry to interrupt, If just a reminder to, um, when you have your question, if you could introduce yourself and your organization so that we have a it's sense of. Um, I am a professor of law. I'm Mona Al Ashkar Jabour from Lebanon. I'm the uh, instigator of the Pan Arab Observatory for Cybersecurity and Safety. So, um, and uh, we work on uh, capacity buildings uh, in Lebanon for legal and technical and security uh, people. So now I would like to know. Uh, I don't uh, get your name, I'm sorry, because I arrived late, but I heard that you're not going uh, to have a legislation on retention of data. Do you uh, think that uh, if you have a legislation on this, it can hurt civil liberties or rights of uh, citizens? But what you think of the justice, criminal justice, that need this data. Yeah. I, I, I think that's... Yes. That. Keep it in mind, please. John, over here. Hi. Um, my name is John Lapreze. I'm a professor at Northwestern University in Qatar. Um, I also am a consulting scholar for ICT Qatar, but I am not speaking in that capacity today. Um, it seems that from, from many of the panelists, one of the most pernicious threats to the issues we're talking about are from um, intelligence entities, intelligence organizations. I don't see them represented here. If we're talking about a truly multi-stakeholder discussion, they're not part of the conversation and they're the biggest threat. What can we do to actually get them involved in this in order to have that conversation? You know, I, I'm, I could look at the audience and ask, and ask if anyone's part of an intelligence entity, I'm pretty sure no one's gonna raise their hand. So, um, but, but they have to be included if we, if we wanna make any progress because to a large extent, they're both opaque and they're unconcerned by this conversation unless they get involved. Okay, thank you, John. And we have another question in the back. Um, can I, sorry, ask, thank you. Good morning. We'll have our own Phil Donahue show. Uh, sorry, my name is American Ray Short. TV reference, sorry, uh, go ahead. So sorry, I <laughs> uh, took my earphones off. My name is Ray Short and I work for Counterpart International. I manage an information security Internet Freedom Project for USAID. Uh, Nizar, you had mentioned that increasingly religion is entering the fold of civil liberty questions online. I hope I am not opening up a Pandora's box, but I'm curious how the other panelists believe that uh, religious freedom and the speech thereof can be protected when religious frameworks are different in different countries. That is, for example, some countries will consider some speech online blasphemous, while others consider it 
core to protecting uh, pluralistic speech. Great, thank you. Um, why don't we cover those questions as you would like? We'll start with Robert. Um, uh, in no particular order, I'll try to comment on each of them. So in, in regards to the issue of the intelligence agencies being missing or not, um, I think it depends on the venue. Um, so what I will say is that um, um, every year uh, for the last three years at the Citizen Lab, we've been convening a meeting in March called the Cyber Dialogue. I'll, I'll plug the conference at cyberdialogue.ca, where we actually make a point of inviting intelligence, military, law enforcement uh, from government, um, from the US, Canada, and abroad, um, as well as others, um, civil society, and the different private sector um, type of entities that are keen. Because um, we do think that um, everyone is talking about cybersecurity. There are some issues where we all have in common. We're all, um, in some cases, may say we're all under attack. Um, um, some of the things that we've tried to discuss with them and others is um, if there are issues of attacks, um, where are there possibilities for collaboration? Um, if data is to be shared, how can, be th how can that take place in an ethical way that protects the privacy of the data being utilized? Um, and there are key stakeholders to have there. They may be under-resourced in some countries. Um, in some countries, they may have a lot of resources. And if they are able to identify issues or threats, um, they may be able to mitigate billions of dollars of economic damage and loss of data by organizations. Um, I know that in different countries, um, some of those collaborations take place. I think it's just what's key for those type of discussions take place is a culture of trust and a, cu and a culture of common language. And, um, you know, my feeling is that in venues such as these that are incredibly very public and very open, it's difficult to have a, uh, a public engagement. And so for our meeting, we do it under Chatham House rules. Um, and we tend to uh, publish kind of a summary of non-attribution of the um, conversations. And so uh, I think that's really key to happen. I know that some initiatives are taking place um, that, that are key in regards to that. So I'll, you know, I'll mention on that, um, I think law enforcement was supposed to be on the panel, um, and, and, they, and they were not. Um, I, I think in regards to uh, data retention, I'll let others talk about this with more authority, but I will just say that in regards to data retention, one of the key issues for a lot of countries that have privacy protections in place is, first of all, securing the data that is retained is a technological challenge. Um, if it is not done properly, then that data will expose personal data and lead to identity theft. Um, it can also be aggregated and used in a way that contravenes not only best principles, but I would say international uh, or regional law as well. So the fact that there are bad criminals out there and they need to be caught is not something that um, is new now. It's always happened. And law enforcement perhaps needs to be better. But just having more data is not always the, the challenge. But I know Kevin had probably a lot and Michael to talk about kind of data retention. Uh, in regards to, to religion, um, I, I think we need to be a little bit careful uh, in it is possibly a Pandora's box, but it does stifle speech. So the issue of um, uh, we in our access contested uh, publication that we published um, about a year ago, uh, we had a researcher from Malaysia talk about how religion is being used to stifle and to censor uh, the internet and has some uh, cybersecurity issues. Um, I think um, one has to be careful. I think what we've seen is that under the guise of religion, uh, a lot of governments try to censor in contradiction to their international human rights agreements that they've signed on to. And so I think we need to be careful, uh, much like defamation, that it is a Pandora's box and used um, to filter and to do other things that aren't necessarily what the government can do. Thank you. Robert, I know Jimmy wanted to respond, and uh, anyone else? Kevin and Michael. Oh, oh everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, do you do you um, show your passport when you go use a public phone? Do you register every letter you send at the post office? No, you don't. It's a liberty right. It's your right to send a letter without anyone knowing that you've sent the letter. 
and you can use a public phone without anyone knowing that you are using the phone. It's, uh, these are essential rights of communication in the free world. And um, of course, in the, on the internet, you can register, you can save every data, but not every technical thing we can do is something we want to do. It's essential even to communicate and it's an essential right of privacy and liberty rights that you can communicate anonymous and that you can communicate without anyone knowing that you communicate and to whom you communicate. Of course, it might be useful to, uh, um, for um, um, well, defending criminals that you have this information. But there are two rights fighting against each other and in doubt, I vote for freedom. Um, not everything which is possible is, is useful. Um, if you want to uh, fight against um, crime and uh, terrorism, yes, of course, it might be useful that you've saved every data you can on the internet. might be useful. But to be, have a perfect, um, well, secure state, it might even be useful to have a camera in every room. We don't do that. Well, most of the states don't do that. Um, but it won't, it won't ever, um, well, a crime will happen even if it's registered. You maybe get, um, have a, a, it easier um, to say, uh, to know who it was, but you won't, um, well, you won't have, to, uh, well, you, you can't avoid a crime. And so I don't think a state, a liberal, democratic state has the right to save these, this data. We have a solution for that issue. Um, it's um, technology like the US. We're using quick freeze. If there is a concrete suspect, you can save the data. We're, we're not saving the data of all 80 million people in Germany just uh, because we're not suspicious. We trust our people. Uh, sure. Uh, on the issue of intelligence agencies, I actually, who raised the issue of it? Yes. Um, I agree. It would be good to have the intelligence agencies in these rooms. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, in the U.S., the NSA in part because of the awful things it's done in the past decade, has been forced to come out of the dark and actually engage uh, in various uh, civil society and multi-stakeholder venues to try and defend its positions, while also not ever really giving much information about what it is doing. So I, you know, to some extent question the worth of having the intelligence agencies in the room, but it couldn't hurt. Um, and uh, now that you mention it, I certainly will be thinking about how to better engage intelligence services in any planning toward any workshop next year. Um, and actually, if I could just interject, as Robert um, mentioned, we did invite law enforcement to come join us. Um, and we, we, it, is, it, it does come up every year. And um, it, hopefully, we can accomplish that in the future. Also, um, another, I know there was another panel that invited defense uh, organizations to come. And that didn't come through this year, but so there is an effort to bring um, by many to bring those um, constituencies to the, this discussion as well. Thanks. Thanks for raising it, John. Oh, sorry, Kim. Go ahead. Sure. To, to quickly sort of address Ray's question about religion, I, I feel that one of the problems when we're discussing cybersecurity is the confusion between cybersecurity which I consider to be issues related to the security of the network and the resources attached to it and the data accessible through it versus cyber crime, which I consider to be criminal enterprise or endeavor unique to the internet and simply crime using the internet, be it fraud or child porn uh, distribution or in some countries distribution of blasphemous content. Um, and so I'd actually... Uh, in responding to your question, say I think that is a legitimately not legitimately off the top off topic question um, in a way that um, or would rather lead me to a different point 
a cybersecurity related point, which is often cyber crime, attempts to address cyber crime or crime using the internet are often counter to cybersecurity. Whether you're talking about, say, lawful intercept solutions that necessarily make our communications equipment less secure, or data retention um, uh, schemes that lead to the creation of huge databases of data that could be compromised by bad guys as well as by governments trying to solve crimes. Uh, or, say, DNS-based blocking. Uh, in the U.S., they threatened to do that based on copyright, could be done for blasphemy. That could be done in ways that, that, that threaten DNSSEC, uh, the security of the domain name system. So, um, so I guess I'm not saying your, your question's off point. I am saying that you have a point that attempts to address crime online can often have a negative impact on cybercrime, and it would be good to, to be better about separating our terms so that we can better see those disjunctions. Thanks, Kevin. Yara, and then Michael, and then we'll take our next three questions, which I think starts with you. Do, do you have a question coming up? And was it you that had a question? Not yet. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I have just two quick comments. One, one with the I'm not the I'm not an expert in data retention, but there's always seemed to be a reason uh, for violating human rights. So we uh, in Egypt they torture criminals because they're not doing their jobs. Uh, criminal investigation, they're not doing their jobs. So the easy way out, they would tell you, we can't really do anything. Do you want your car back? Do you want your house back? You have to. We have to torture them. And in the same way, if there's other ways that respects human rights and people's privacies and individual rights that you can actually work through them. You don't have to use everyone's data. So, for example, in Egypt, the security service have de personal data about everyone. People were amazed on the amount of papers found, really unnecessary papers and uh, emails printed out, uh, transcriptions of phone calls for nothing. They do surveillance just out of precaution which is totally the easy answer. So I don't think any, I think it's too dangerous to always take uh, a pretext of human rights violations. So I, I would leave the, the, the experts in retention. I think their answer is very uh, um, uh, better than mine. But this is my point of view concerning religion. Uh, I also think it's very dangerous to, to, to bring in the, the, the discourse of uh, having religious or cultural sensitivities or relativity of human rights into the internet sphere. Uh, so the same governments who are actually doing it offline uh, and human rights institutions such as the Human Rights Council are keeping on bringing it up online and private companies are also uh, being blackmailed for this. So if, if you take the example of Google uh, uh, blocking the video for against the profit in Libya and Egypt and then removing the blockage then now they're facing legal cases against them in Egypt because now users knew that they were able to block it. So why, why aren't they anymore? Uh, so I think it's really, the, any, we have to really insist that the internet is an open and free space. Uh, and always the limit of free speech is the incitement of violence from my point of view. So if we keep it this way and try to push away the discourse of religious and cultural sensitivity because this is really objective and depending on each and every person not and you cannot really generalize within a country to the e &E. so uh, so i think we have to keep on pushing for that discourse not to enter into the open and free uh, internet sphere thank you great michael thank you briefly on um, the question of intelligence pre being present uh, I mean, you don't have to go that far. We are, I mean, we have this discussion and discourse with law enforcement. And one example where this discourse takes place, and I think in, a, in, a, in an open and transparent way, is in, in ICANN when you, we talk about who is. Because there is this tension between law enforcement, you, you can see it in the room, and, and the privacy uh, authorities. So, so there, there is a transparent uh, discussion on, on this tension, on data retention, uh, Jimmy uh, was, was pointing out there is a tension also between the European legislation and uh, what you are advocating, but it's very fruitful and understandable. But this discourse is also taking place in a very transparent and very, I mean, vivid way and, and in that level. And on, on cultural values, we, we have one thing that has been, it's not only the religious question, 
for a long time with us is that there are different orders and constitutions in the world and we're not going to change them. We have the First Amendment in the United States that goes much further than some national legislation. And even within, for instance, um, in the case of Germany and Denmark, uh, Nazi uh, propaganda or speech, there are different legislation. And these are conflicts that we, we will not be able to solve, but it shouldn't be something, an instrument that uh, impacts on the security uh, and, and the security this discussion, what is security and what is done on the online malicious attacks, that can be, we can de de deal a day w on that, but it, it should be uh, kept really unemotional and at, at, at the level where we have most threats today, and it's becoming more threatful e every day. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, other questions for our next bundle of um, topics? Can we start back here? Mona, can we come back to you once we let other people have a question? Great, thank you. But a gentleman back here needs a microphone. I probably should just do it. <laughs> Hilda. Thanks. Jeff Brueggemann with AT&T. Uh, Robert mentioned information sharing, and I think that's another area that involves um, security and privacy intersection. Does the panel have suggestions or ideas on what are ways to balance um, the concerns about um, how, to f how to design information sharing in a way that, um, as a private sector provider, we're very concerned about a situation where we're sharing information, but there could be criminal liability and those types of things that could be triggered at the same time we understand the need to have strong privacy protections. Um, and that seems like if we're going to improve cybersecurity, a problem that we, we really have to solve. So any thoughts from the panel on that? OK, great. Um, another question here. And does somebody else have a third question we can put into this mix? OK, we'll take two then. Um, Bill Smith with PayPal. So following up <coughs> on Jeff's question, or just sort of uh, seconding it, this is a significant issue for many businesses, is the ability to share information amongst ourselves about threats, about uh, not necessarily, well, account takeovers, let's say. We have that. Um, and that we believe that by sharing some limited information, but it has to be of a almost necessarily will be of a personally identifiable nature, but that by sharing that information for cybersecurity purposes, we can actually enhance individuals' privacy if the information is pr properly protected and it is done for an appropriate purpose. So I'd like to hear the, the panel's thoughts on that as well. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Kevin, Kevin, you kind of touched on it in your remarks, um, yeah. so maybe we could start I mean, with you to address this. I am curious what you'd like to hear beyond. I, maybe you missed my, pre, my initial remarks. So my opening remarks were about the cybersecurity discussion in the U.S. and the work that civil society did with those in the Senate who were working on the Cybersecurity Act and basically trying to come up with new, lim new information sharing authority that would allow sharing as necessary to preserve cybersecurity, but basically uh, with limits consistent with fair information practice principles, such as you know use limitation, purpose specification, data minimization, um, making sure that there are accountability mechanisms in place, so that it's not a, a blank check to share a, a wide swath of data, uh, limiting it to civilian rather than military agencies, limiting it to s cyber crime, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the types of things that we, th types of ways we think it would make sense to balance these concerns. One one concern I have and. Uh, I, 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 one of the things that I think has been lacking in the debate, and considering it is such a long-running debate, it's kind of stunning, is I have yet to see a simple, and you know, I, I live in Washington, D.C., where we live on one sheets and, and, and uh, you know, one pagers that brief you on an issue. No one has ever shown to me a good one pager on here are the top five, like, most basic common cyber attacks here are the types of information relevant to that attack that one would want to share, and here are the legal limits that are currently preventing us from sharing that data when it happens. 
that kind of specific information about the specific types of data and the specific types of sharing and the specific limits on sharing that are currently hindering it, I think would be incredibly helpful to informing the debate. And uh, um, I, I urge anyone with those kinds of you know, thoughts or resources to, to inject those into the debate. Thank you, Kevin. I'd also just to touch on that, um, a distinction that I think is important here because we've been talking a lot about sharing information with the government in this panel and I think both both questions address another element which is sharing information between companies mm -hmm. um, and does that interject a different um, situation or different requirements or or, or to some degree um, alter the way that we can address it because that was as you know, kind of a big discussion in yes. this particular uh, legislative um, debate in Washington. I, I do think it does change the debate a bit. Um, the the human rights and civil liberties concerns are, are lessened uh, to some extent, although certainly in our legal framework and perhaps others, to the extent one has obtained consent or authority to share information with a third party, it may be that legal protections for that data don't follow the data to the next person you shared with such that it would actually be easier for the government to get that data from the person it was shared with rather than from the company directly. Um, but I think that the same basic concerns, although they would probably be cast more as consumer privacy concerns than as human rights concerns, would adhere even with business sharing. And you'd want the same types of limitations in terms of only sharing what is necessary, stripping out identifying data where possible, um, limiting it to specific cybersecurity uses would, would, be, would be sensible. Okay, I think Michael and then Robert want to address those two, and then we'll start another round. Yeah, just to, to add f from the European perspective, um, that would not be outside the law. So um, the European data protection legislation, uh, and we, we currently are discussing an updated, no longer directive, but directly applicable uh, uh, legislation or regulation, would be applicable both for private operators and government. So uh, even exchanges between both or the data protection legislation would be in place. So, so this is just, uh, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's rather in detail regulated. Robert. I just want to get maybe to the, to the second question about um, kind of account issues um, and maybe a little bit of context and then, you know, a couple of kind of suggestions and try to answer it. I think the issue of account um, issues is one not only that affects companies, I think um, a variety of different stakeholder groups, be it government, but particularly we saw in the case of the developments in the Middle East, um, activists were using uh, a variety of different services, be it you know YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere, and some of the governments uh, directed some very sophisticated attacks or very crude attacks to either disable SSL or um, infiltrate some of the social networks and a lot of accounts were taken over um, and a lot of the companies weren't necessarily monitoring or knowing what was going on and so I would say that for human rights, some of the human rights groups and some of the academic researchers that are following the targeted threats to civil society organizations online sometimes because they're looking at it will actually see attacks taking place or we'll hear from the activists about strange things happening to their accounts and there are no formal mechanisms currently for that to be uh, exchanged with different companies. And what ends up happening is that, depending on the trust relationship that exists, um, and I'll just say from personal experience with the Tunisian um, uh, uprising, if you call it, um, I just had a lot of contacts um, in Tunisia because of the World Summit on the Information Society in 2005. And a lot of colleagues would tell me we were, we're having issues. And it was because of personal contacts, either at Google, Facebook, or Twitter, that those companies actually recognized what the problem was. And so what I would say is that there's a great need, I would say, that um, there are institutions or organizations that exist at a national level, academic, and corporate level that are called computer emergency response teams. And that is missing for the NGO sector. Um, and having that sector being able to coordinate and share through those type of mechanisms with companies and elsewhere. Um, 
you know, NGOs are not really resourced. They don't have access to the malware working group and all these different things that companies do to see where things are happening play. So I would say, you know, one needs to take a step back and find ways of um, increasing maybe the informal type of contacts when those type of things. What companies can do is have very clear information on their sites that when such type of attacks take place, what people can do. One of the biggest complaints by activists on the ground and some of the companies has fixed this since then is that there was no single point of contact and there was no way to track that question over time how the company dealt with it. And a lot of time tickets have been open for well over a year in regards to getting an account recovered. And it was because uh, uh, identity policies or other things and so I would say that you know um, and I know some of the, the you know my experience when I've dealt with different companies is sometimes you'll get a ticket you'll get someone call you you'll get an update you can go in you can see how long it's been open I think there's some just normal consumer type issues that, that can happen and those need to be shared and I would say that would be a great panel for next year's IGF what are the different companies doing what are the different governments doing in regards to um, you know, dealing with incidents. If this happens in the ICANN space, doesn't happen here. Maybe that's a good idea. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Yara, I know you wanted to address the point. I just want to continue on this point with the Egypt case because uh, one of the <laughs> also leaked papers, thank God, they entered into uh, the security, uh, state security premises, uh, is that there were meetings between the three uh, telecommunication companies with the communication ministry and the uh, interior ministry of actually an emergency uh, room uh, that allows uh, the government when when they need it. Uh, it happened before the huge uh, labor strike in 2008 in Egypt and they were planning it in 2011 as well because they knew it was going to be big. They didn't know that it was going to turn this way. But anyway, they wanted, they, they had a plan uh, of uh, uh, cutting old communications uh, and slowing down some websites or cutting it to completely down. Of course, I'm not sure any. I think all of you know that uh, uh, the government in Egypt shut the whole communication, the internet and, and uh, mobile phones. So people were completely uh, uh, separated from the whole world and their families. Uh, but this is actually another way of how um, private companies can cooperate with the, with repressive regimes. But uh, another thing, they, they first shut down a couple of uh, numbers for activists uh, that were open uh, online for, uh, for legal support for protesters. Uh, and when, when those activists came to the company saying like, why, why did you shut down my, uh, my, uh, my mobile phone? They were like, we were instructed to, and we, if we would say no, the whole company would close down in Egypt. So to that extent that when a company opens up in Egypt, they have to sign to a contract saying that they, can't, they should abide by any commands coming from uh, that relates to state security, uh, national threat, and, and elsewhere. So to that extent, um, private companies are very important to, and they have a, a big role in support of human rights or violating it uh, on the other side. Thank you. Thanks, Yara. Okay, well, let's go with the next round of questions. Mona, I think you wanted to come back to something. Then we have a question there. Let's start with Mona. And then, um, I, um, so just one second. Let me see if there's others to follow up. And then you, and then you. No? Anyone else at the moment? Okay, be thinking about a question. <coughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, we all know that uh, since the appearance of what we call now the government or the state, Government's work relies mainly on data gathering, data uh, conserving, data following. So data is very important for government to ensure not only security, but our rights and civil liberties. So I have the impression since a while now that some systems, because some systems abuse Everybody is talking about choosing between liberty, freedom, and security. It's not the issue. We want, them to, the, we want the two of them. We want our national security, because if we don't have national security, we don't have freedom. Now you have a regime that is abusing, is a thing. You have a citizen that doesn't know how to defend his civil rights. It's another thing, but talking all the time about choosing between freedom and national security 
is wrong. And I think we are uh, dedicating time to think that it is not to be discussed. Well, I think you're addressing sort of one of the goals of this um, workshop was to address how they are mutually reinforcing, um, how they can be if they're not, what are the mechanisms, perhaps maybe we can address this uh, before the end of the session, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, if the mechanisms for that kind of synergy don't exist, how do you create them or what are good models for that that we've, you know, we might have touched on some here. Um, and uh, may, that can fuel some of the discussion. Question there before Hi. we m move on. Go on. Hi. Uh, am I being heard? Yeah, I am. Okay, I had a question uh, for you and, and, and I'll start with a comment and a two-part quick question. Um, I, I'm not sure how an Egyptian blogger or an activist uh, writing something which is critical against the former Egyptian regime affects, and I'm commenting the last comment, affects the Egyptian freedom or the sovereignty of the Egyptian government. So I don't agree with that previous comment. I think that's not fair. Uh, it is that the governments are the ones with the power, not the ones with the guys who are sitting and blogging. So I don't see how they can impact that. That, that it doesn't, it, I haven't understood that. Um, I w the questions I had for was for two, two part, very quick one. You saw, you, you talked about the kind of things that, you know, businesses were doing. You saw that what a, a UK corporation had done by selling some sort of a, a software. Um, would you think that these kind of things that you are seeing by these b businesses, would you turn them as abusive practice or corrupt practices? Because I'm using sort of an analogy with something called the For Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the U UK, US, which says, you know, if, if somebody gives somebody a bribe, in any sort of developing country and happens to be a US company, then that's prohibited. And there's a huge investigation that goes on. And I'm thinking, right, somebody gives someone a bribe from our cultures, I'm from Pakistan, it's important. And I think that's something they should stop. But when something like this happens, where, where the things that you're describing, isn't that even more important? So that's my, my, my question is, do you think that's abusive practice or in, in forms corrupt? And the second question is, what would you expect as someone within Egypt or uh, from the UK government from the, or from the US government, from other governments where these corporations are, what can they do to try and help you for these things not to happen? Thank you. We'll add one more to that discussion and then um, perhaps if we could ask everyone to, uh, after this one question, does anyone else have a question to add? at the moment. Okay. Perhaps then once we uh, include this last question, if I could ask each of you to answer the questions or respond to the comments in a sort of closing way and we'll just go down the line um, so that we can address um, um, any number of issues that you want to in the questions than the discussion we've had today. We've got about 10 minutes left. Does that sound okay? Okay. Thank you. Last question to add to the mix. Sure. So um, Bill Smith with PayPal. It's on. Now it's on. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> Bill Smith, PayPal. Um, respond to Kevin's point. Um, I think it would be great if we could come up with a list of five things. I can give you two off the top of my head, which are uh, would be directory breach where a username and password, or and especially a large number of them. But when, when those occur, um, companies tend to be reticent about sharing that information, even though it might be a very good thing to do, because a username can be considered PII in certain jurisdictions. Phishing. Um, the message itself is sometimes considered a private communication. Um, our view is, well, yes, it's a private communication perhaps, but it's between someone who wants to steal from you to someone else. And do we, are we going overboard perhaps on the privacy side in that instance? And then you, you run into questions about, well, how do you decide? But we have an issue because um, if, if the fish is directed at us, PayPal, eBay, or any other com you know, companies, if we don't learn about it in a timely fashion, we can't do anything about it. And the half-life of a phishing site is now 24 hours. So we need to act very quickly. Um, and so there's another example. In some cases, we may get notified. Other cases, corporate counsel will say, no, we won't share anything. And it's... The real issue is a li it's a liability issue. There isn't necessarily case law in the United States that would support certain actions, and so companies are hesitant to move. There are some of the issues, 
um, I, I think so just in response and we, we would we'd love to work with people to make it more obvious that we should be doing the right thing in the right moment and sharing the right information yeah and I, I mean I just really like to respond uh, you know the content of a phishing email is one easy concrete example It'd be great to have more. I certainly wasn't intending to question that there are certainly legitimate sharing needs. The question is, I still don't feel that the debate has gotten to a point where we've actually been able to have a really constructive discussion about how to narrow the information sharing provisions. Uh, well, yeah, um, but thank you. And we should, we should talk more. Great. Um, why don't we go ahead and just go down the line to close out um, addressing the comments I think from uh, the wide range of security that provides for privacy and freedoms specific questions about the company involvement and how to further that and um, very tactical information sharing questions so from very broad to very narrow take your pick <laughs> okay thank you very much um, I'd like to come back to the idea to have um, uh, intelligence here uh, on the panel. It would be a great idea. Uh, maybe you've heard of uh, that Keith Alexander, the director of NSA, appeared on a DEF CON conference in Las Vegas, which was quite surprising to me when I attended that. And um, he was saying, we're not spying on every American. <laughs> my, my, there's space for Just most of them. Uh, he didn't say that. But it would have, uh, it could be nice to have uh, people like that on, on, at the IGF and um, get get further on with uh, ideas like that. Um, but to come back to to um, that very complicated thing between security and freedom and liberty right, uh, liberty rights. Um, you, you're right. You can't have um, freedom without security. But those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Okay, so uh, first of all, of course, I disagree with you. Um, I think national security is totally overrated. I'm sorry, but uh, spying on activists blogging and organizing for a protest where protest is illegal in Egypt at the moment is really not any... We're not uh, going to have a protest with guns. We're very kind of, most of the activists are generally peaceful, using their pens and their ideas, and being in prison for this. So actually, thank you. I don't want to turn this into a conversation. I'm just uh, commenting. As you had the right to comment, I have the right as well. Uh, so, uh, so I don't think that this is a, a good trade-off. National security is always talking about uh, bombings and terrorists and so on. Well, uh, monitoring all the people didn't prevent uh, terrorist uh, attacks from happening in Egypt and from happening elsewhere, as I guess. Uh, I would think, I'm a lawyer, so I cannot really say it's um, abusive practice or illegal practice, but I really wish that, uh, that it would be at one point illegal to sell those softwares uh, and to also sell uh, tear gas and to also sell other arms that were actually used against protesters and peaceful uh, citizens. Uh, uh, having very strict surveillance on your citizen doesn't make you any safe or any secure. Uh, violating your, the individual rights of your citizens doesn't make you any more democratic, doesn't give you a good example. It's not about a few countries using surveillance and it's not about a few countries abusing their powers or something. It's a trend all over the globe. It's not, it doesn't only happen. Uh, the U.S. sends people to get tortured in Egypt, uh, which is something because they cannot do it at home. They send it to us because we are the torturers of, of the region. That doesn't mean that the U.S. is free of torture. Um, so I wish we can, on, specifically on your question on how people in the U.K. and the U.S. can help us, is there are a few campaigns, for example, against the tear gas distribution and the arms uh, and, and how there was a huge thing about how there were arms being sent and tear gas uh, during the Egyptian revolution by ship uh, and there were uh, people protesting there to uh, prevent it from entering uh, the country. This is something that I would really uh, think would help us. Uh, pressure groups uh, from different countries where the, those companies exist 
the companies that sell uh, spy uh, spy software or other arms used against uh, protesters or any kind of like <laughs> uh, dissent happening in those countries, especially when it's well known that those regimes are using it against their citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Yara. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, so I am going to agree with you to the extent that I think that discussions of rights versus security are not that productive and not where we should be focused. Um, although I certainly also agree that national security is the most often abused rationale, um, you know, the, the, the reason, you know, the most often cited reason for violating fundamental rights. Um, but if you look at, uh, you know, the security situation in my country, 9-11, um, which, is, you know, I was in lower Manhattan for 9-11. I experienced that. It was very unpleasant. I take national security very seriously. Um, my national security agency implemented a widespread wiretapping program that, in my opinion, I think is, was clearly illegal. Um, and we had inspectors general from our various military and uh, law enforcement agencies do a report on that program and ultimately concluding that they couldn't find any evidence of any significant anti-terrorist impact of this program that violated the fundamental rights of, I believe, based on whistleblower evidence, every American. You know what did have a fundamental anti-terrorist impact in my country? Hardened cockpit doors to make sure that terrorists couldn't take over planes and use them as missiles. And that didn't impact anyone's fundamental rights. Um, I think that analogy maps to cybercrime actually pretty clearly. We're often so focused on securing the network when we maybe should be a little more focused on securing the software and securing the resources. Why don't we focus a bit more on improving the software and improving authentication methods, uh, you know, basically strengthening the walls rather than surveilling all the roads to the house. Um, those types of efforts to improve cybersecurity would not implicate fundamental rights at, at all, but would improve our security significantly. Thank you, Kevin. Michael. Yeah, agree with reinforcing the, the walls. Uh, I, I have missed a little bit in the discussion that I had said from the beginning, I think there is not necessarily a contradiction between the, the two, and we have seen it in the le legislation, now our e-privacy directive, and uh, this will be expanded um, in, in the security strategy. <clears throat> but there should be some of these intrusions should be really an exception, and these things shouldn't be in a gray zone. So I, I really stress the need for the rule of law, f due process, uh, decisions of judges, because otherwise it's all gone in, in, a, in a mesh. And that is how we see. We've had a, a long discussion, a long discussion in our telecommunications, new te the communications package in the European Parliament on the question, and that was only for the copyright issues. I say only, but the copyright issues uh, about, about judges deciding to look into these things. So I, I, I stress there should be due process. There has to be the rule of law and it has to be transparent. And that helps a lot if these things are brought up into the open <clears throat> and that you can see what happens. Thank you, Michael. Nizar. Thank you. It's a couple of things. About, uh, about the, uh, I, I believe that uh, private sector company need to cooperate or create an entity where they can share this information, uh, a non-for-profit entity, or some, because, for example, in Syria currently, most of the accounts are hacked at the same time, or, or, pa or the passwords are being revealed under, under uh, learning torture, they are revealed for all this at the same time, so it's better to have some entity where they can report and not to open a ticket with every single one that will take forever to be uh, to be released. The other issue, the other issue is about the legislation that is ongoing. Is that because currently in most of the Arab world, after the Arab Spring, there is a lot of legisl uh, legislation that is being passed uh, related to cyber security and national security and the only and the purpose of this is mainly it's mainly any flow in these in these laws will lead to human uh, to human right violations and to be and to be used by the by the secret service to 
to to spy and to get us back into police states. And that's why we need to be very careful on this area. Currently, we have been able to stop many of these laws, like Lira, like the e-transaction laws in Lebanon. These two laws, they are all, we were, they were called by by uh, by many organizations as the Gestapo law. Because we're getting really backward into becoming every citizen, becoming um, guilty until proven innocent. And the last, the last one, I would like to. Every single go government human right violation has been has been covered as national security issue, every single time. And this is we need to be careful that we 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 don't we don't play this game national security and the human rights. Human rights is the priority. National security comes second. The only way we have a nation and we have a security is because we, have our, we are human and we have our, we have our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Nizar. Thank you very much, Nizar, for some very powerful comments there. I just wanted to echo something that, that Michael, you mentioned, and you took the, the points off my list. I think something that we had mentioned earlier, but we mentioned in the closing, Things that are key are really raw. Um, uh, that didn't come up earlier, but that's very key. Um, um, independent oversight of these mechanisms that might exist that hasn't been mentioned and I think is very key. If you are going to have agencies that are going to be intercepting or other things, they need to have a system of civilian oversight that's well documented and transparent. Um, I would say that um, research is much needed in regards to a lot of the cybersecurity issues. Different entities are doing research, not necessarily sharing it. And going, um, Kevin, to the example that you mentioned in regards to planes, I think that um, if we know better what some of the cybersecurity issues are from the aspect of the users or some of the targeted groups, um, we'll have a better sense of what training and other issues are, are really needed. My fear is that a lot of the security training that's taking place by a variety of organizations and funded by millions of dollars of public money is um, based on a concept of threats that are available 10 years ago and not the ecosystem that we find ourselves in today. And they're having a false sense of security. And so we need to share what the current situation is and be able to um, do that. And I would say um, systems that don't have bugs and operating systems um, is a good place to start. Um, I would say here that um, the example that you gave about planes, I would say another example is uh, a lot of times when due process is talked about in regards to um, getting warrants is a lot of judges and police will complain that it takes too long. It takes too long because they have to print out everything and send it by fax. If maybe they had um, electronic systems that were more modern, uh, they'd be able to expedite the process and review it, and then all that information could be made available in a much more faster way. Um, and I think that's not done. And I would say that if one thing has come clear is that these issues are very complex. They involve a variety of stakeholders, and security is winning the agenda. And capacity building, particularly for civil society, to be more robustly and rigorously engaged is much needed because otherwise the security agenda will win. And so we must really have a civil society that knows how to propose solutions, monitor the situation, and engage in this issue. Thank you. Wow, I'm glad I did that. That was a pretty, um, pretty robust and thorough and thoughtful way to close the session from all of you, I think. Um, uh, my largest takeaway is that, um, well, twofold. One, I think that we could build a whole other workshop around this for next year, and maybe we can um, invite people to think about what kinds of questions and what kinds of folks we can bring along to, um, to further that. Um, Second, I think uh, you know this conversation isn't over even for today. The security, openness, and privacy main session is this afternoon's uh, plenary, so um, it's another opportunity to hear some of the uh, dialogue around these issues even today. Um, and lastly, Robert, you made a suggestion about the f a, a workshop for next year, and we have. Um, um, perhaps collectively our work cut out for us to bring some of the uh, law enforcement and intelligence community that aren't here now to the table for next year. 
So those are my three sort of takeaway points. And um, I think we got around to finding ways to work it together um, in, in the course of in the course of the discussion today, and I, I urge us all to continue to try to do that. Thank you all for coming. Please join me in um, thanking our panelists. <laughs>